Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is the first day of South by Southwest, and we are so honored that you chose to spend it with us, and also that it is International Women's Day, and I am joined on stage by three other amazing women. Thank you so much for being here. Today, we hope that you're going to walk out of the room with some concrete insights about how the next generation is using technology and how we all can show up to support their well-being and really shape a healthy digital future. My name is Kelsey Noonan, and I'm here with Pivotal Ventures, which is an organization founded by Melinda French Gates to advance social progress in the United States. I lead our work on adolescent well-being, and I'm joined by three organizations that we support philanthropically, and I'm so excited to be in conversation with today. Dr. Emily Weinstein is the executive director at the Center for Digital Thriving at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. The center creates research-based resources that help young people thrive in a tech-filled world. Katya Hancock is executive director of Young Futures, a nonprofit that resources innovative solutions that make the digital world an easier place to grow up. And Kyra Kyles is a media force and executive director of YR Media, a tech, music, and storytelling training platform for the next generation of impactful content creators. We have many different lenses into this topic of teens, tech, and well-being today, but I would also love to get a sense for who's in the room and who we're talking to as we start this panel conversation. So if I can get a show of hands, if your work interacts directly with young people, maybe you're an educator, you services, amazing, okay, a lot of you. And let's see a show of hands for those of you who may have a teen or tween in your households that you live with, also amazing, lots of folks here. What about those who are working on technology that teens or tweens may use? A lot of technologists, great. Um, and storytellers, reporters, or journalists that are covering issues that affect Gen Z or Gen Alpha. All right, and then a show of hands for anybody who remembers being 13, 14 years old <laughs> fondly. Yes, okay, great, amazing. <laughs> Either you were very popular or you had things you were passionate about, and I love that for you. Uh, and who remembers being 13, 14 with a lot of angst and stress? Yeah, a lot, a lot of us on that one too. Um, well, regardless of whether you raised your hand for one or all of those, it is going to take all of us to shape this world of digital technology for young people. So I'm so excited that you're here to learn from our panelists today. And because we're four adults up here talking about teen insights uh, and, and teen well-being, I actually want to start by hearing from young people. Kyra of YR Media, can you tell us what we're about to see? Yes. So I'm really excited. We work with 14 to 24-year-olds across the country, but most notably in Oakland and Chicago where we have physical locations. In fact, we have some YR stars, as I call them, right here in the audience, sprinkling around. <laughs> yes. And so... What we did was we polled uh, 14 to 20 year olds that are part of Wire Media and just asked them about their relationship to technology and what adults may be misunderstanding about their experiences within digital life. Great, let's keep up the video. a group chat with like everyone in one of my classes and it's like when we go on breaks like we are now we have like this way to still talk to each other plan stuff and um also because i'm like a student activist i feel like um there are like many like group chats and stuff that i'm in that like make me feel kind of like you know in like this rocky world like there are other people that think like me and it's like uh, that are actually trying to do something seeing um plus size communities um, I'm plus size, so being able to see how other people dress themselves and being able to express ourselves with fashion mainly, um, I struggle with trying to feel comfortable in my body, so being able to see like other bigger size bodies wear clothes that I wish I would be f feeling comfortable wearing and then I see them and I'm like, oh my god, why don't I, you know, try and change the way I dress and feel more confident in myself? If they could do it, I can do it as well. Oftentimes, I will delete Instagram and for months, maybe, I think the longest I went was a year and a half without Instagram or any form of social media, really. 
and what I, I think that really just kind of frees my mind a little bit and because I'm it's it's a it used to be a big cause of stress for me not everything on the phones and on the internet is bad yes there's a lot of bad things but there's also a lot of helpful things so being on the phone isn't always a bad thing but there is things that you should look out for and make sure that your child or someone isn't like getting sucked into the bad stuff because that's the one thing that I talk about with my mom is that my mom didn't grow up with social media or a mobile phone or anything like that and so and she has it now but it's not like it wasn't in her brain from the beginning and so I feel like the more I explain it to her and the more she understands the more she's able to like recognize how it has had like an impact on me i feel like in our generation there's like you, whether it's a good or a bad thing like for greater or for worse um social media and stuff like this is i wouldn't say necessary but it's like very like standardized and it can like not having these like social medias not having a phone in general can like even though it's a bad thing can make you very outcasted adults misunderstand how complicated it, it really is you know for someone you know someone in gen z we i've sort of grown up around technology so there's almost a different language that we speak in you know i communicate with people differently there's so much to like do i like this person's post do i not there's a there's a language there's a sort of hidden rules and it's not just as i don't know it's not as easy as um they think i feel I first want to thank the YR stars for sharing their voice with us today, um, even though they couldn't be in the room. That was really amazing to hear how they, how they talked about the role of technology. And it strikes me that they talked about technology in very different ways. Kyra, what headline did you take away from, from those videos? I think it, it's important to, that we're having this nuanced conversation because what I took away from it was that nuance is required. Instead of trying to ban young people on social media or ban their use or take away their phones, it really is a conversation that has to be about layers and usage. And so I think we need to work with them on the solution and not decide things for them. That's what I took away from it. That's really interesting because I think that that's so different than the headlines I often see in newspapers about teens and technology. We see things like the lost generation, the selfie generation, it's all very unidirectional. And so I actually wanna read a headline from a newspaper that's giving advice to parents and ask Emily as an, as an expert in adolescent development to comment on it. So this quote is, make sure your child isn't using this new technology as a means of emotional overstimulation or as a retreat into a shadow world of reality. Children are developing the habit of dividing attention between the humdrum preparation of their schoolwork and the compelling excitement of this new technology. And before you answer, I should name that this is actually a trick question because this is not a headline of today. This headline is from 100 years ago in 1929, and it describes the allure of radio talk shows. <laughs> <laughs> But obviously radio talk shows are very different from social media, even though this headline still feels like it could apply to the way that we talk about technology today. So Emily, what is different about social media than the radio? I love that you started us with that headline, Kelsey, because it's such a good reminder that adults have worried about teens and new technologies for a long time. And it reminds me of a comment from a teen in our research who told us the hardest part about growing up with today's technologies is my mom blaming everything on my phone. <laughs> and I think about this because there is so much that is hard about being a teenager. And it can feel to teens so minimizing and invalidating when we act like the phone is the cause of everything that is hard for them. Um, and at the same time, you know, we've talked to thousands of teens about social media and what it's like to grow up with smartphones, and a lot is hard about it and is different about it. Um, they tell us it's a source of connection, but also of isolation, of inspiration, and of really toxic social comparison. These things coexist. And I think about um, the stories we hear, I, I love that example about activism, and I think about the stories we hear from teens about the power and potential of social media to connect them to what's going on in the world, to raise awareness about important civic issues, 
and at the same time how incredibly complicated it is that they feel like their peers monitor who speaks up about every civic issue, who's posting and who's not, Silence is seen as taking sides, and yet if you post, there are so many ways to get it wrong. And I think that is so important because to your point, there is a lot that's different about being a teenager with a radio talk show in 1929 and a Motorola Razor in 2004, that was me, and, a, also me. Um, <laughs> and an iPhone and TikTok in 2024. Today's technologies are really designed to capture and hold our attention, but they also play on our emotions in ways that are really amplified for adolescents and that tap into things that are already developmental sensitivities. So um, the group dynamic dynamics, the challenges around self-regulation, um, the sensitivity to social feedback, these are all things that have been part of adolescence since long before social media, but now we have technologies that are amplifying them in really profound and meaningful ways. I appreciate that point that tech is an amplifier and it can amplify both the highs and the power of social connection um, and the lows, some of those stressors of being a teenager. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, I think that the research really does tell us that tech can be an amplifier and an accelerant in ways that really matter. And at the same time, one of the things we see so clearly is that what's amplified is actually different for different kids. So teens are not having a monolithic experience of tech or social media. And tuning into the differences, what's amplified for different kids is really essential if we want to think about and understand what the impacts are on their well-being and what kinds of interventions they might need to support them. That's really helpful to hear. And Kyra, you, we've heard some, from some of the YR stars earlier in this talk, but you work with a lot of people who have their pulse on the priorities and needs of this next generation. Why do the stories that we tell about teens and technology matter? Well, you know, I was just thinking when you all were talking about the old school, I'm dating myself here, I don't care. If anyone remembers the slam book, you know, or the burn book, you know, and, and as you mentioned, technology is like this accelerant. Um, you know, I think what we're getting maybe wrong is just as there's doom scrolling on social media where you're looking and you're just seeing depressing thing after depressing thing, a lot of the headlines that you see are like that. And what it does is it just creates this culture of fear that isn't helpful because again, it goes back to, well, this is something negative, let's get rid of it. Meanwhile, when there were slam books, nobody said ban paper and notebooks and pens, right? You know, so, so I think it's important to think really hard about those headlines. And also, that's why why our media's model is to have young people tell their own stories. You know, when they look at social media, they definitely see the challenges, and, and that was mentioned in some of the video that you saw earlier, but they also mentioned opportunities. So framework is important. You want to be realistic about what's going on, and we don't want to sugarcoat that there are very important challenges that being on social media, being on, and being subject to trolls and everything else that those create. But at the same time, if you come at it from that framework, then it's almost like you're trying to ban it and take us back into an era, and we can't go back. You know, there's no way to do that. So I think the important thing is to provide that nuance, provide that balance, but also allow young people to talk about it um, in a way that, that works for them. We don't want to have the equivalent of doom scrolling when it comes to the headlines that we produce about something that does have potential as well as, as setbacks. I love that you're describing doom reporting alongside doom scrolling. Um, and you talked about your experience coming of age and, and remembering being adolescent. As, as an adult now, what role can you play in sharing some of those experiences with the wire stars that you work with? And so we, we're working with young people that are journalists, and so you, that what we really want to impress upon them, but I think it can also apply from a broader perspective, is we just want to be very clear with them about potential ramifications. Not saying it in a way where it's a warning or a threat or, or making it sound worse than it is, but really just saying, hey, there's a digital afterlife. This is something that if you put out there, it's going to live on for years. How do you feel about that? What are you thinking? If it's an issue of particular weight, sometimes we'll engage their guardians just to make sure that we are keeping them safe online because we don't want to just put them out there. We wouldn't do that you know, with adult staff. You know, I've worked as a journalist for 20 years and, and I've spoken with editors about stories that had my own personal perspective before putting them out there just so that you can walk through those things. But I think what it is, it's also about realizing that, yes, they're, they're teens, but they're also edging into becoming young adults, so you want to treat them with respect and allow them to have the agency uh, that they need in order to tell their stories, but their stories are super important. We just want to make sure that they understand what the potential ramifications could be. And I think it's really important to 
equip young people with information to make their own decisions. That's really talking about agency, which is, I know, something that comes up a lot in your work, Emily. Yeah, and I, I love that Kyra emphasized the importance of youth voice. It's the absolutely the not-so-secret sauce of the way that we think about research and creating resources. Um, and really this idea that actually adults have a really valuable and important role to play. I think that sometimes people misinterpret youth voice and amplifying youth voice as being about just getting adults totally out of the picture. And there is so much power in thinking about the idea of adults as allies. And educators and parents in particular, we know, have really valuable, powerful roles to play in being allies for young people. Um, and that's one reason why our, our center has been working with Common Sense Education on free resources um, for the classroom and take-home resources that aim to support digital well-being, premised on creating more space for young people's voices and different perspectives and also actually creating paths that build digital agency um, so that young people have more intentionality and control over the ways that they're thinking about tech. That's a really important point, and I think will probably resonate with so many of you in the audience, because I saw a lot of hands go up when we asked about working with young people or having young people in the home. And recognizing that we can be allies and really show up in a supportive way, I think, is a critical framing. I also heard both Kyra and Emily talk about the importance of connection, including intergenerational connection and the fact that young people are using digital connection to build community, build peer groups. And Katya, I wanna talk a little bit more about that because as we're talking about connection, we're also talking about its opposite, loneliness. And by many measures, this is the loneliest generation in recent history. What is Young Futures doing to focus on social connection? Social connection is actually as essential to our survival as food or water. Um, and that is, is backed up by a lot of research, predates back to times of our ancestors. Think about what people had to do to survive. They had to band together to hunt large animals. And if they were kicked out of their tribe or somehow separated, they were, faced, uh, they were facing the dangers of the wilderness by themselves, which is you know, very scary and, and you know, affects their survival significantly. Um, so today, uh, as you mentioned, loneliness is a huge issue in our society. Our Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy, put out a big advisory around loneliness in America last year, which um, hopefully many of you saw, really sounding the alarm there. If you think about the way we live our lives, we are much more isolated as a culture in America than ever before. So I'm sure many of us in this room get groceries delivered sometimes, get food delivered, through DoorDash or some other service, and, and that is awesome. Who doesn't love, you know, just Netflix and chill and get some great food delivered? Um, but what does that take away from our lives? Think about those experiences when you're in the grocery store and you run into your neighbor and you get to connect with them and ask how their family's doing and maybe commiserate about the pothole in your neighborhood. And then you're left with this feeling of connection and belonging to something and being part of a community. And subtract all those moments from the lives of millions of people and, and what does that do? And that's the moment that we're in right now as a society. And so what does that mean for teens? And I, I do think that some adults feel you know, I see kids on their devices all the time. You know, they're, they're so connected. Like, how could they be lonely? Um, and it's actually a very paradoxical time because kids are actually, yes, very connected. The number of teens that say they're on their devices almost constantly has doubled since 2015. So they're, they're on there, they're connecting, but they're not having meaningful social connections. Um, in fact, 50% of teens feel they don't belong at their school. Um, That's just, half of all teens. Half yeah. of all teens feel that way. A quarter of teens feel either fairly or very lonely every single day. Um, so this is really a crisis. Um, it has major health implications. Another stat I find so impactful from the Surgeon General um, is that loneliness is as much of a predictor of future health outcomes as whether or not you smoke. So being uh, constantly lonely can be as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So if we really think about that for a second, that's really significant. Um, so we see this as just, it's a five alarm fire. Like kids are needing help and needing support and needing tools and strategies to have agency in their lives to connect social, connect meaningfully um, with, with their community, with groups that they have shared interests with. 
Um, there's an amazing body of work all around social connection. Um, we're partnering with a group called Foundation for Social Connection. You can read more about their research. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, but we're here to help. We're here to provide tools and solutions that can equip teens. Um, as Kyra mentioned, they're just a few years away from being adults. So what we help them with now, they can carry through for their whole lives. I think that what you just described is focusing on a very human emotion and a developmental need, which is connection and avoiding loneliness. I want to turn it to you, Emily, to talk about then the role that technology plays, again, as an amplifier, mm -hmm. um, as, as you were describing earlier. So belonging and mattering and social connection, these things that we're talking about, these are foundational to well-being and to positive development. And one of the things that's really important for us to acknowledge is that technology can truly support these things. It can be a source of affirmation for teens. We heard that a bit in the video. Um, it can truly be an absolute lifeline for teens. And at the same time, tech can complicate those things, that belonging and mattering and connection in really meaningful ways too. It can amplify the challenges. Um, so teens tell us about, we heard about group chats, teens tell us about how group chats are like the modern day version of the middle school lunchroom, <laughs> but there's no bell after 30 minutes. Oof. It's around the clock with the good stuff, the social connection, the inside jokes, the being with your friends, and also the complicated social dynamics, the second and third guessing yourself, the wondering why people liked one person's text but not yours, or how you should react to someone else's <laughs> message. Um, and so just think about these kinds of dynamics playing out. So I think that's part of it. Um, the other thing is that adults talk a lot about FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, but actually, when we listen to teens, we really are forced to reckon with this idea of COMO, knowledge of missing out, which is a reality that is very much created by te today's technologies because um, we can see on Venmo that all of our friends have been charged by one friend for movie tickets and realize we weren't invited. Or look in real time on a map and see that our friends' avatars are clustered together and realize that we weren't invited. And this is a really different way of amplifying some of those same challenges around feeling included, being included, um, that we've had for years, but are, are playing out really in, in real time and in meaningful ways. The fact that the bell doesn't ring after 30 minutes and that you have that knowledge all of the time really must be a challenge, especially for young people when they're still developing and when they're still really forming their identity and their friendships. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something that comes up a lot from adults, which is around mental health and the impact that Como might have <laughs> on, on mental health and uh, the role of technology that plays in that. And we've all described a little bit about what adults get wrong when it comes to describing the relationship between technologies and, and youth well-being. Um, but how does that play out in, in the teams that you talk to, Emily? There's a hidden toll of the mental health crisis that we don't often talk about, but it is so obvious once you hear about it, and that's the social support burden that comes along with being a teen in the context of a generational mental health crisis. So even if you are not personally struggling, you are, as a teen today, more likely than ever to have friends who are. And some of those friends are reaching out for help through texting or crying out for help in public or semi-public ways on social media. So imagine that you're a 10th grader and it's 10 p.m. You have a math test the next day and you have a friend who you know has a really tricky relationship with their parent and they are reaching out for help through text. And you are now in a position where your desire to disconnect for your own self-care and for sleep gets pitted directly against your empathy and your desire to be a good friend. This is a tension that we don't often make visible or talk about when we just think about the pull to the screen as being about design features or self-regulation, which is absolutely not to minimize those things. I think a really important part of thinking about agency, you know, I was talking earlier about building agency, is not just thinking about what teens can do, but recognizing that, um, that these are issues that are very much created by systems and by design. It is not an accident that they're having a hard time self-regulating. So we do not want to put the burden of correcting issues that are created by design on the shoulders of kids or parents or teachers. 
And we also really want to think about the way that some of these tensions are playing out and what it might look like to actually build agency in this context. It's so helpful to hear that example, especially at that 10 p.m. point, um, because I think we have a conception of teenagers just doom scrolling or watching mindless content or cat videos, or maybe I'm just <laughs> talking about myself. Um, and what you're describing is really a, a real reason to be online and to, to be a good friend. And that's so much more complicated when it comes to sleep and setting limits, especially for somebody who's still figuring that out for themselves. For sure. Kyra, what else do adults get wrong when it comes to talking about mental health and technology? Um, you know, so we've, we've talked a little bit about what adults get wrong in terms of just going for like the fear, which we all know doesn't really bode well. If you think about what your parents or guardians said to you, trying to put the fear into you and, whether, and how you responded to that, whether you believed it, whether that made you want to challenge it, do it even more. You know, I think that's, that's one of the things that we have to think about. And then also just in general, um, I think that adults feel that it's their job to, you know, guide in a way that doesn't allow for young people to bring their perspective into it and that we feel that we have this wisdom and we feel that this threat is so big and so enormous that we really just have to pull out all the stops. But what I do find is that young people also recognize these things. Many of the things that you all were talking about, and they are instituting that themselves. And I think that's an interesting part is that they recognize these things and are coming up with ideas and solutions. And I think what we have to create is the space for them to communicate that so that we can come up with solutions together instead of just, you know, kind of shutting the gate on technology, which is, is something that has never worked. I think, you know, as, as we talked about, radio talk shows have continued, have they not? You know, so that, that threat is still out there, guys. Watch out. You know, now they've even got podcasts, so be careful. <laughs> The, the draw of the screen. Um, and what is the, what is the media's role in reporting on how teens behave in this way? Because yeah. I, I heard a quote recently that is, society sees the teenagers it expects to see. Wow. Um, and so a lot of the, the reporting that we see done by adults is very much treating them as a monolith. And you mentioned this earlier, but what's the role of media? Well, I saw a headline uh, today, as a matter of fact, where someone referred to it as uh, digital fentanyl. Um, that's what they said. Horrible, right? And you know, and just think about like the imagery that that evokes for you when you hear that. It's just too much. Um, you know, I, I think what it is is that we just have to be careful in the framing. You know, be cautious about uh, being more expansive. As I always advocate, and as I mentioned, our wire stars are here working as journalists right now among you. Let them you know, take the wheel and let them do some of this reporting. We were doing uh, some stories once about artificial intelligence and we were coming up with our adult headlines. And I admit, I probably came up with the scariest one. It was like the black mirror. You know, I'm embarrassed now that I came with this, right? <laughs> And the young people saw this and they were like, all right, calm down, first of all. <laughs> Relax, you know. Uh, they, they said, you know, this is AI. Yes, it can dupe your voice. It can dupe your appearance. But look at some of the positive things that this can do. Look at some of the, the grunt work that we do in design world that can be taken away and so that people can really zero in and focus on creativity. Yes, it can dub Jay-Z's voice, but Jay-Z will be okay. You know, you can know Jay-Z <laughs> bars from any bars. It's not, you can't really confuse anybody with that. Um, so, you know, I think what we've learned from them is to look at it all also from a lens of hope, and these headlines are really not doing that. The other thing I think is important to note is that when they talk about teens, they're mostly talking about, in their mind, they consider this mainstream, we're talking about white teens. So they're not taking into effect like some of the experiences that young people of color have and the things that they deal with, you know, racism, you know, they're, they're not thinking about gender issues, you know, and, and different gender identities when they, when they say teens, you know, they have this certain picture in their mind. And young people are not a monolith and reporting this way probably not only doesn't get across what you wanted to get across, it alienates them. And then they're just going to dig in deeper because we know that's how it goes, right? You know, which, which I don't disagree with. Um, that when something, you know, sounds too scary to be true, it probably isn't. So I think some of that can be alleviated by allowing young people, empowering them rather, through platforms to have this voice because they have it anyway. You know, young people are influencers. They're doing all this work. They're not waiting for permission slips from anyone. So the best thing to do is to work with them, not against them, and try to frighten them, you know, as, as we've seen historically has happened whenever there's been a shift or wave in technology or the way that we connect. 
I personally am glad that I survived the radio area to be. I, I'm glad to, you made it too. To, to be I'm glad here you with made all it. of all of you today. Um, <laughs> but I love what you just said because you're describing what I think is very common in the way that adults see young people and talk about them, and it really pits it as an us versus them. Absolutely. Um, and adults seeing young people and seeing them as an other in a way that then disallows some of the communication that needs right. to happen between between generations. And I really appreciate the point that you made around hope um, and the fact that young people are culture keepers and they are really shaping the way that all of us use these technologies um, and the kind of technologies that they want. Katya, I wanna talk about Young Futures because Young Futures is really unique in that it's focused on solutions that meet young people not as a monolith, but across the many different ways that they use technology, whether that's watching YouTube to learn how to, to cook or a new hobby or connecting with folks in a group chat as Emily was talking about before. Um, but why is Young Futures focused on solutions and what does that look like? Yes, uh, we really have one aim at Young Futures and that is to make it easier to grow up in the digital world. Um, so, you know, I just wanna acknowledge for a second for you know, parents, educators, caregivers in the room, um, if you're listening to us talk and saying, but it's really hard out there, and my kid is struggling, or I'm seeing how hard it is, we see you, and we, we get that. We absolutely agree with you that it's really challenging right now to be a teen, and sometimes tech use is very, very hard. And as Kyra said, Every kid is different, and how they come to tech and what they do on their phones and other devices is different. And for some it's negative and for some it's positive. And so we're really coming with that approach that there is no one size fits all solution. Um, and what we're doing, the way we're going about our mission is helping the helpers. We are going to fund and support orgs on the front lines, <clears throat> the nonprofits and grassroots orgs, that are building solutions that are making an impact on helping teens and their families and, and the adults that love them. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, again, it's just a real emphasis on solutions um, in the sense of there's a lot of talk about the problem um, and we care about the problem and we're trying to focus on solutions. And one of the main solutions you hear about from media is just limit screen time across the board, or let's have a blanket ban of this type of technology. And again, that's gonna be good for some kids and bad for others. And so we just don't believe in a blanket solution. Um, and also when you have that mental model of tech is the only problem, it diverts all the attention away from the myriad of other challenges that teens are facing, to your point, Emily, that are contributing to some negative mental health outcomes and challenges with general well-being. So we're about, like you were saying, Kyra, the layers and the nuances of just individual experiences. Um, and so I'm really excited to announce today our first funding challenge. It's called the Lonely Hearts Club Challenge. It's a million dollar commitment to support nonprofits with solutions in this space. So we're putting out, if you go to youngfutures.org, you can read all about it. And if you're a nonprofit, please apply. We'll have two a year on various themes. Um, so we're gonna keep it coming because we're here to really uplift this growing ecosystem of people who are supporting teens. Can we pause for that? That's a million dollar yeah. commitment to help young people <laughs> grow up in the digital age. Um, and that signals such an important move in the space to really, as you described, help the helpers and focus on what it means to grow up, whether that's with or without technology. Can you talk a little bit more about what this funding challenge will look like and the supports that you will be giving to those nonprofit organizations? Yes, we're really excited about this. Um, we feel really privileged to be able to give these financial grants to nonprofits and um, have to think, our partners at Pivotal, Susan Crown Exchange, and The Goodness Web for supporting this initiative financially. Um, and it's not just about the funds that they need. We are building a six month program called Young Futures Academy, where the grantee leaders will enroll and we will help them navigate the ups and downs of scaling their org. Um, from leadership support to storytelling support, a peer community, because it is really powerful to be networked together with other leaders who are working on similar challenges to you. 
um, coming from different walks of life with different backgrounds and networks and institutional knowledge. Um, so there's a lot we're gonna be doing to support these leaders over this six month period. Um, and then we'll do it again with the next cycle, with the next challenge that we'll launch in the fall. So that's something that, that we're thrilled about. This is a really amazing space, this youth well-being space. And I see, you know, orgs like like yours, Emily, and yours, Kyra, who are who are farther along and have been making a really big impact. I mean, YR for 30 years, um, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but this is an, an ecosystem that is maturing, and that is great because the the world is worried about this and focused on this, and and we really believe the solutions are out there, and we want to support them. And I know that that's why many of you are here. And you are also welcome to join us immediately after this panel at a, for a reception just outside in the hallway for lunch and to meet the team and to learn more about this funding <coughs> challenge. Um, I would also love to hear a little bit more, Katya, about what you mean by social connection for this funding challenge. What kind of organizations are social connection organizations? Yes. So we don't an anticipate too many of them to say, I'm a social connection organization. <laughs> um, it's actually been really fascinating to dig into this space and meet a lot of the nonprofits doing work here because what they're doing is <clears throat> bringing teens together around shared interests and passions and the amazing byproduct is community and social connection. So it could be an org that is helping kids be political activists around climate change or other topics they care about. It could be an org that brings people together around art or music and all kinds of things that they're passionate about. It could be something that an educator has created for their school that they see is scaling and applicable to schools across the country. Um, so we're, we're very open-minded. We don't know what we don't know in this space. And I think that's the exciting thing about doing funding challenges is is people come in and, and you're, they broaden your own mind about what's possible. You know, when you were describing that, I was thinking about another adult frame that we often put on young people, which is to put things in silos. We love categorizing things. We love talking about art and music as separate from health, as separate from education. And what you're really describing is a core theme around social connection that can cut across any of those settings. And Kyra, I know that this is a big lens that you take through your work of breaking down silos and really looking at some of these issues holistically. Yeah, one of the things that we learned at Wire Media, and this was in fact through uh, Pivotal's partnership, is we did a project uh, with, with Pivotal where we asked young people to define what mental health means to them, what is mental well-being, and through that research, what we found is that young people did not want mental health put in a separate category. You know, I'm in the journalism industry, and we put everything in a box. The technology beat. You know, there's a Taylor Swift beat. There's a Beyonce beat, right, out here in, in some of my... Can I get on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> You're not um, on that? <laughs> so, yeah, you, you can go first, right. So um, I think that what we had to understand is that though we thought of mental health as its own category, and this is something that has gone on in the media for years, young people said no. What we really want to see from you is mental health interwoven across all beats. So career, life, school, education, um, activism, all of these things involve and affect mental health and they shouldn't be put out into a separate area. So what we've done through that research is one, taking that mental health little tab that we had on our website that was leading people to that coverage. We still have it because we want people to be able to find it, but what we do is we just apply a more holistic lens to coverage and try to make that part of it. And rather than having someone who's a mental health correspondent, we understand that most of the young people writing for us, journalists or op-ed writers, that they are going to infuse that into the coverage that they provide and that we want to provide them also with the space for that by making our platform reflect their preference. So it was a big learning moment for why our media and I think really just informs the way that we do things moving forward because we always want to be doing things in concert with the 14 to 24 year olds that, that we serve. Understanding mental health as underpinning so many different issues feels like a really profound shift because it is part of a whole, a whole life um, and shows up in all those different ways. And in many ways, a bigger lens on well-being is the same. Absolutely. And I want to hear again from the young people that, that prepared a video for us sure. today, but I want to talk about how young people are navigating 
technology and their mental health and what they're doing proactively to identify solutions. Right, and I'm glad we have the video because I love for them to be able to speak for themselves. I think that's the important theme that, that we're uncovering today and really hammering home. In, in general, what I think would be surprising to some is that, yes, young people are aware of these challenges. They're aware of some of the things that they're experiencing, like as um, Emily mentioned, the Como, they know that. And so they are already taking preemptive steps. We as you know, guardians, as allies, we can help with that, but it's not that they are not thinking about these things and they actually have come up with some really effective ways to contend with it. So I will let the video do the talking because uh, I was like, let me take some of these tips and write them down because <laughs> Slack is driving me nuts right now. <laughs> My phone um, is the main technology that I use. I used to constantly be on it, checking my social media. It's just kind of being too connected on my phone. And something that I did was I put it away. I started using Do Not Disturb more often. Um, if I needed to do work or homework, instead of doing it on my phone, I would use my computer. And the one thing I would probably change to it for the betterment of my own well-being is just I guess getting rid of like notifications. I used to always be facing the screen and watching videos and the change I made was from going from watching videos to mainly listening to music and not facing the screen as much as I used to. Now everything's like in my ears and stuff and I can still pay attention to everything that's in my surroundings. That uh, I have a, my own laptop which Back before I, back when I got it, I didn't exactly have a phone. So I would always open it. First thing I would do, even though I knew I would, I would mostly, I was mostly supposed to use it for work or homework or school. I focused mainly on either pulling up something on YouTube or on games, and I knew I had to stop that. So I, I mainly blocked all notifications from both, and then I would just, I would just uh, basically lock the apps for until I finish my homework. I've started practicing just like keeping my phone away from me like when I'm at dinner or like when I'm doing homework and stuff just like kind of like keeping it on the table across from me and I feel like that makes such a big difference even though it's such a little thing the notification and stuff and feeling like you always have to be updated like you always have to be in the loop that can be like very like bad for your mental health. Putting the do not disturb allowed me to focus on myself more. Um, I was able to gain more connections with like, well, feel more comfortable talking to people in person um, just because I'm not secluded to my phone or in times where I would pull up my phone when I didn't want to talk to anyone, I forced myself to just sit there and be in the moment and just take in what I'm surrounded like in my environment. Like I remember um, about a week into like my social media cleanse, we were driving across the Golden Gate Bridge and I just remember like actually looking up and looking around and not being on my phone and sort of appreciating what was around me rather than what was in my hand. I feel so grateful to have been able to hear from young people about the way that they're basically hacking the devices that they're using to work in service of them. And I think that that's something that's really remarkable about young people is regardless of what uh, limits adults put on, what screen time limits, they will find a way around them, but they're also very proactively thinking about how to manage a life that works for them. And as we've talked about this entire time, that may look different for different young people. I also appreciate that these young people were talking about very different experiences, and you all have mentioned this in different ways. We're talking about the challenges of growing up. And the internet did not invent most of these concepts. The internet is not responsible for puberty and smelly armpits and the joy of a first crush or the drama of mean girls and being left out of a, of a high school cafeteria room. And because I'm a millennial, I can say this, it's also not responsible for the poor fashion choice of low rise jeans. <laughs> you heard it here first and I regret that they're coming back. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, but you can hear more from the YR Media team outside at the reception. There will be a raffle and a giveaway yeah. to celebrate 30 plus years yes. of reporting and centering. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to keep talking about solutions. We heard how young people are talking about ways that they're, they're shaping their digital life. But Emily, you've done a lot of work at the Center for Digital Thriving to build resources that can help young people either do these hacks or, or navigate other highs and lows of, of digital interactions. Yeah, so, so one thing that um, teens tell us about is the experience of being left on red, where you send a message and then you're waiting for the person to reply and you can see that they've gotten it, that they've read it, but they haven't replied yet. And you start having this feeling like, did I say the wrong thing? Oh, I'm so stupid, they must be mad at me, I shouldn't have said that, we're definitely not gonna be friends anymore. And you can go on this kind of thinking spiral. And maybe you've had an experience like this too, where you send an email for work and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have sent that email. Yes. Um, these kinds of thinking spirals, so th they weren't created by social media. We can have these kinds of, in psychology, we call them cognitive distortions or thinking traps. And we can have these kinds of thinking traps without technology involved. So I might be, I had a series of thinking traps this morning where I was like, I shouldn't have packed these pink pants. I'm a psychologist, not a fruit salad. Why am I wearing them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had another thinking trap. Actually, someone got up from like maybe halfway down while we were talking before, and I had a thinking trap where I was like, oh, we should be more, I should be more engaging, like, we definitely, we're, we're not being interesting enough, that's why someone left, and that is so interesting to recognize because those are thinking traps that in psychology we actually know contribute to anxiety and we know a lot about how to help people disrupt them. We know about strategies we can use to help people mind shift and to regulate. So I, I'm using that strategy like in real time while we're sitting up here, I'm thinking to myself like, okay, maybe she had to go to the bathroom, maybe she got a call. And that, that practice of actually coming up with alternatives applies when we're talking about teens in tech too, because we can start to help teens go through that process of being like, oh, maybe they're at sports practice, or maybe they didn't see it, or maybe they're just distracted, or they'll get back to me later. These seem like small things, but something that is incredibly powerful about getting into the detail of what's hard for teens, what their pain points are, is that we can start to trace connections to interventions and to evidence-based practices that we know will make a difference for those challenges. So in this case, being able to say, that's a cognitive distortion. That's a thinking trap. That's a spiral that we know how to help you shift your self-talk around. And so one of the things that we do um, that our Center for Digital Thriving team spends a lot of time doing is listening really closely, trying to understand the pain points and then trace those connections so that we can really turn up the volume on evidence-based practices that we know will make a difference and help teens around those particular struggles. That's really amazing to understand the, the psychological background and the evidence that really supports a tool like this. For those who want to engage with a tool from Center for Digital Thriving, and you're describing one called Thinking Traps, where can they learn more? Yeah, um, we'll have information at the reception. All of the resources that we've created are free. We would love if any of those thinking traps resonate with you. Um, that shoulds one, which is like, oh, I shouldn't have packed these pants. My colleague Sophie calls that shoulding all over yourself. Um, we have a whole glossary of thinking traps and there is something so powerful about having the name for it. Um, even before you start getting into the strategies, just being able to say like, oh, I'm, I'm mind reading. I don't know that she thought that we should have said something more engaging or whatever it is, that is a really powerful intervention. So we would love to share with you if these resonate our Thinking Traps resources um, and we'll have some of those out in the reception. What you described, being able to put a name on a pattern also <laughs> seems really important because what we've heard from a lot of young people and the stories that we told today is that folks feel very alone in their experiences. And so they might think that they're the only person second guessing themselves or being spun up with, with anxiety around mind reading. And what you're saying is that's actually really common. That's not the case. For sure. Tell us about some of the other tools that the center has, has been working on. So some of the most interesting conversations that we have with teens about digital well-being actually don't start with technology at all. They start with the teen. And this pivot has been so meaningful for us. I want to tell you a little bit about it and how we've been designing around it. So um, we often start conversations about tech by asking questions like, 
how much screen time is okay, or why are you so addicted to TikTok? Um, but one, <laughs> one, why are you TikTok so addicted is to fun. TikTok? I was like, I know why. Yeah, it's I fun. mean, we know why. But, <laughs> but I already mentioned the cat videos. So. <laughs> yeah. um, but one of the things that we found is that um, it's extremely powerful to start with questions about the teen, about who they are, what they value, what they're experiencing. And one of the tools that we've created to help do this is a value sort, where you start by reflecting on your values. What's most important to me right now? So maybe for me right now, I would say that's presence and justice and connection. And you actually anchor in your values. You think about which are the most important to you, doing a, a value sort, we call it. Um, and, and then you actually do this process and think about what role does tech play in making it easier or harder for me to live those values. So maybe for presence, I'm thinking about the fact that when I'm with my kids, um, I have little kids, and I'm thinking about the fact that sometimes at the end of the day, presence is a value that I have, and yet it is so hard for me at the end of a work day. I have colleagues who are on Pacific time, they're still sending emails, it's hard for me to stay present. And I recognize that that's a value, and it tees up a different kind of way of thinking about my habits, because I can realize if I want to be present, that pull is real, and I might have to leave my phone in another room. And it's not just about habits that take tech away, because it might be that a value I have is connection, and how I want to use tech is I want to remember that I want to reach out and call someone who I really care about or send a message to someone um, for support because I'm a little nervous about if the pink pants are okay or not. And that <laughs> quick FaceTime call can make a really big difference. And um, so just thinking about values as an anchor, um, we have a, we've been working on a value sort app and we're actually pre-releasing it this week. So you can demo it in the reception. And I would love for you to do that because I think that you will see that when we start not with questions like what should our screen time be, but with questions like how do I want to live, we end up having really different conversations about digital well-being. I'm so excited for all of you to interact with that tool because focusing on values is very similar to what Kati was describing earlier, which is focusing on just the challenges of growing up and what it means mm -hmm. at different ages, on different days, and every young person and every family is really different. Knowing that many of you have lived experience in this space with young people in your lives, I want to ask the panel, what advice would you give to the adults in this room mm -hmm. to support youth well-being and their own thriving. And Kyra, I'll start with you. Of course you would, right? <laughs> so let's see here. Um, I, I would just say that listening is an important part of the process. A lot of times, and I say this as a, a journalist, where a lot of times we're just seeing all these headlines telling us this, that, bringing the doom every day. It becomes tempting, I think, to have a knee-jerk reaction to that and just give instructions. Put that phone down. Turn those notifications off. Get out of that group chat. Stop talking to that person. They make you upset. And when you do that, you're closing the door to communication. And so as a storyteller, we're all about talking and sharing and producing, but we're also about listening and taking in information. So I would say one of the most important things is just do that data gathering, talking to young people, listening to them, hearing the nuance in the conversation, and reacting to that rather than some of these really, and admittedly, frightening headlines that we're seeing about digital life and the ramifications that it can have, particularly on well-being. I admit myself as a, a grown woman, uh, there, there are certain things I don't read in the morning when I'm reading through different news stories because I want to start my day in a certain mood. I mean, I want to know information, but I don't want to like leave the house thinking like, oh my God, you know, this is going to happen to me or that can happen to me. It's really something that can occur. So I think if you think about it from that framework, like how does that impact you and then process that before you have these conversations, I think it will help inform the manner in which you do it and that it will be more effective because it will be more of a two-way uh, communication versus an instruction or a warning. Kyra, I appreciate that point. I switched from listening to the news right off the bat to listen, listen to music. And it's it really real. changed my day. It's real. Uh, Katya, what advice would you give? Yes, it's interesting because since I've come into this space of youth well-being, I've really shifted my own mindset. I, too, am a mom. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. Hi, Az and Coco, because they will watch this back oh. on YouTube. Um, they don't yet have devices, or sorry, they have iPads. They don't have phones or social media, but this is coming at us so quickly. Um, my son plays a weekly Minecraft playdate on Zoom with his friends. It's actually a very positive experience for him, and so my shift to let's focus on what 
what they're doing and come at it with empathy and understand their experience has been pretty profound. Um, I think as parents, we feel very much, if our child is in distress, let's fix it. That's very natural. Um, and I do think a lot of adults will see if the, if the distress is coming uh, with tech involved, that tech is the common denominator and the quick fix is, is let's take a break from that phone. Um, actually, uh, Emily and her co-director, Carrie James, wrote an amazing book called Behind Their Screens, which really helped catalyze the shift of my mindset. And one of the stories in that book is around when um, you know a teen wants to, along the lines of the teen wants to talk to their parents about something that happened. Uh, they got kicked out of the group chat. They're really upset. They're afraid to go to their parents because they are afraid the parents will say, this is a phone problem. Let's take away the phone. And that breaks down the line of communication in a way that is really critical for future support um, when, when that family structure is just really needed. Um, so coming at it with empathy and just asking questions rather than trying to immediately fix would be my main advice. And Emily, your book, Behind Their Screens, is full of examples like that. And I know that many folks in the audience may be interested in learning more. Where can they get access to your book? We'll have um, in the reception some postcards that actually have a QR code. We have a free copy of the audiobook for everyone who's here. So we would love for you to listen and, um, and really listen to the stories that teens told us they most wanted adults to hear, the things that they most felt like they wished adults understood. Um, and we'd love for everyone to have that experience. Great. And what advice would you give to uh, the adults in the room? Yeah, so we, we often talk about this importance of empathy and we talk about the idea of empathy over eye rolling as a critical pivot. So this impulse to eye roll, it's completely understandable and yet the pivot to empathy is game changing. And one, I just wanna share one story with you, Carrie and I over the summer, um, Carrie sitting in the front row, my, my hype woman. Um, Carrie, so Carrie and I wrote this book behind their screens. Um, over the summer, we were giving a book talk at Harvard and um, we did a talk in the morning and we were sharing some ideas from the research and some of the complexities that young people just really wished their parents would acknowledge they were facing. And so we give our talk and the talk's in the morning and later that day I'm going to dinner and I get in the elevator and a woman is in the elevator and she says to me, I was at your talk this morning and this is a real story. She said, I just wanna tell you, um, I left your talk and she's like, I had had, before I came on the plane to come here, I, I got in a fight with my daughter about a bikini picture that she had posted on Instagram. And she was like, I was so annoyed. And we got in a fight about it. And she's like, I left your talk. And after I went to lunch, I called my daughter. And I got really, I did what you said. Like, I got really curious. And I was asking her about why she feels like she needs to post this and what kinds of pressure she's feeling. And she's like, and then I started remembering what it was like for me to be 15 and how I was thinking about my body image and how I thought about what other people were thinking. And she said, she said to me, this is like all between like floor 20 and the lobby. She's like, this, she's like, it was the best conversation we've had like maybe in several years. And I wanted to share that story because I think we're talking about a lot of innovations and solutions and resources. You do not need a fancy resource to change the conversations you're having with the teens in your life. You can do it literally today. Between now and dinner, you can have the best conversation that you have ever had with a teen in your life by doubling down on listening, getting really curious about what it looks and feels like for them, and really embracing that pivot of empathy over eye rolling. I love that example because it also makes me very hopeful that it can be as simple as, as being empathetic and listening. And our founder, Melinda French Gates, describes herself as an impatient optimist, which I think is so apropos in this space because we are optimistic about where this next generation is going. We believe in the extraordinary power of the next generation, and we need to build in some more supports in the digital mm. world to help them achieve that full potential. And Katya, I would actually love to talk to you a little bit in, in our final minutes here about what it means to build in supports so that we're not just leaving young people on their own to navigate these challenges. Yes, a really helpful analogy is one that Vivek Murthy cites a lot. Um, which is when automobiles were popularized, there were a lot of fatalities on the road initially as, as they gained in usage and popularity, um, and we did not get rid of cars. 
uh, what we did was invent things like seat belts and driver's education and crosswalks near schools and all kinds of regulations and supports to make that uh, product that we use in our lives every single day more safe. Um, and so that analogy inspires me a lot because I think we can do similar things around technology and social media um, and lean into the positive use cases for them, um, for, for teens and adults, um, and you know, mitigate some of those risks. Um, and, and that's what, what we're trying to do here. We're trying to support solutions that can, support, that can help today, right away, because there's really no time to waste here with, with the, like we talked about earlier, the loneliness crisis and you know, the myriad of other struggles that, that teens are facing. Thank you for sharing that. And what I heard from all of you was that what, while we're often focused on this singular relationship between technology and mental health and youth well-being, it's actually a much more nuanced story than that. And a simple narrative of just put down the phone doesn't really get at the complex experiences of growing up as a teenager today. And you each described examples of that, from knowledge of missing out in Como to hearing stories of, from doom reporting about mm -hmm. how adults are talking about uh, technology to even just fundamental shifts to thinking about empathy and building in supports for young people. I'm so excited for you all to have the chance to learn more about the work of these three organizations at a reception hosted by Pivotal Ventures just outside. You'll also have a chance to meet some of our other philanthropic champions, the Susan Crown Exchange and the Goodness Web. And you'll learn more about the Center for Digital Thriving uh, with their team there, Young Futures and the Lonely Hearts Club Challenge, funding yes. challenge, and Kyra Kyles with the 30 year anniversary of YR Media. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing the conversation outside. Thank you.